We're going to begin this week with a quick review of the FOMC press conference. Start with opening remarks. Uh, Powell says uh, FOMC is squarely focused on the dual mandate. They are seeing consistent progress. Inflation eased substantially over the last year. Talked about the balance sheet. Securities holdings will run off at a slower pace. No change in the MBS cap. The cap is at 35, but principal payments, he says, are running about $15 billion. And they're not really going to increase until uh, rates start going down. Treasury's cap has been lowered from $60 billion down to $25 billion. So the combination of the two is a runoff of $40 billion uh, a month as opposed to the roughly $75 billion a month now. Not appropriate. Oh, sorry. Uh, recent uh, monthly inflation shows lack of progress. Not appropriate to change the target rate until we have greater confidence that inflation is heading back to 2%. That's a theme he returns to again and again in the press conference. So far this year, the data has not given us greater confidence. There are risks of moving too soon and of moving too late. This is another theme that he returns to, that the dual mandates uh, are in balance. Uh, he mentions that he normally they normally pay attention to the one furthest from their target, and at this point, it's worth paying attention to both. Q and A, Reuters, are you confident that the current policy rate is sufficiently restrictive? Uh, unequivocally, yes. Uh, the evidence supports that. And uh, he also said it's clear uh, that we are sufficiently restrictive. New York Times, Bowman says rates may need to increase. Do you see that as a risk as well? Answer, unlikely the next move uh, would be a hike. Associated Press, you did not say rates at peak for the cycle and appropriate to cut rates this year. His answer, policy is well positioned. There are several paths, one for keeping rates here, others for cuts. The three of these together uh, are quite clear that Powell does not see a rate increase. Are the are rates sufficiently restrictive? Yes, it's clear. Do you share Bowman's view? Unlikely. Uh, you didn't say these two things. He talked about several paths, keeping rates here, others for cuts, none for hikes. I think, I think we have a Fed that is done hiking. Wall Street Journal, to what extent were looser financial conditions responsible for inflation today? Do we need a period of tighter conditions going forward? Uh, his answer, uh, hard to know that. But he did note that economic activity did not accelerate, even with uh, the yield curve uh, performing a bull flattening uh, into the latter part of last year and the early part of this year. Economic activity did not accelerate. So he's, uh, it seems like he's unwilling to completely blame looser financial conditions. Uh, Follow-up question, labor market is strong with wage growth growing. And his answer is, we do not target wage growth. He's not going to get involved in the conversation on this. He says this a couple of times. Washington Post, do you have time to cut three times this year, given the calendar? And he says, we're not thinking of it that way. I don't know how long it will take. This sets up uh, the SEP uh, for the next meeting. Will there still be three uh, rate cuts penciled in? Uh, Follow-up from Washington Post, anything from January to March that suggests something more worrisome specifically about uh, the CPI uh, and PCE? Uh, takes a long pause and says, not really. The signal we are taking is that it's likely to take longer to gain confidence. CNBC, what areas of inflation do you expect to be worked out in the coming months? And his answer is, my expectation is that over the course of this year, we will see inflation move back down. He's quite confident about that. And he did uh, mention housing in this. Follow-up question, is there a, con uh, a contradiction in slowing balance sheet runoff while keeping rates elevated? And his answer was, this is a plan we have had in place for a while. Next question was from Bloomberg. Has the probability of no cuts increased or stayed the same? And his second question, is there an argument for being patient with inflation and let the economic cycle do some of the work? Or the first question, no probability estimate. We are confident. That's all. Uh, second question, we focus on which goal is further from target. Both goals are in better balance now. 
Financial Times, will rates be lower at the end of the year? A pretty straightforward question there. Q1 GDP, do you see stagflation risk? Uh, first question, I don't know. He says, I, I didn't think he was going to answer that one with a yes. It's just that's an I don't know. Uh, as far as the second question, we don't see the stag or deflation, which was a quote played again and again uh, after the press conference. Um, Bloomberg Vice Chair suggests GDP potential has gone up and therefore our star. Do you share that view? And I've said this before that if uh, rates at 5.5% are not slowing down the economy, then the neutral rate is significantly higher given the financial sophistication of the U.S. market and the ability to hedge out interest rate risk in a lot of places, the economy is simply not that sensitive to interest rate risk as it used to be 20, 30 years ago. That alone would put the neutral rate much higher. Uh, his answer, he acknowledges growth in labor force from immigration, so more supply. And when we think about potential GDP, it is uh, growth uh, from labor inputs plus a growth from labor productivity. So he is noting that labor inputs are up, so there's more supply. However, labor productivity, uh, which we will see in a little while for the first quarter, came in at uh, 0.3. Not very good at all uh, for, for the quarter. Uh, so productivity isn't really helping out, but labor inputs, if we're thinking about the potential, that has uh, increased. So he is acknowledging that, yeah, potential, uh, potential has increased, but he didn't really address our star. A follow-up, growth is higher, uh, but you're not considering rate increases. Are you now more worried about causing the economy to slow too much? Uh, no, we believe policy stance is in a good place. Fox, any discussion of a rate hike at this meeting? Uh, answer was policy discussions about holding the current rate. And I believe if you listen to this part of the press conference, as he's handing the mic back, you could hear him whisper, Biden sucks. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Politico, election year, is the bar for rate changes higher? Which I thought was a good question. Uh, we are always going to do what is right for the economy. We will not be political ever. Why? Well, they have to say that. But uh, let's see what their actions are. Uh, their actions do. The Economist, why is wage growth still strong? And the answer is it has come down. It's about 100 basis points higher than pre-pandemic. Uh, we don't target wages. Marketplace, consumers are feeling the weight of higher interest rates. What do you say to them? And I've made this argument that consumers can shop around to lower their personal inflation rate. But once you hit them with interest rates, there's very little they can do. And if we're thinking about who carries the burden of debt, uh, it's usually the bottom 50%, 60% uh, that have a lot of debt. The finance industry is broken down into two big segments. There's wealth management and there's debt management. The cutoff is about uh, I'd say 25% here, 75% here. And this 25 is more like 10% and 15%. 10% is true wealth management. 15% is more um, smaller, uh, sort, sort of smaller uh, type of um, um, wealth management. You wouldn't even call it wealth, just savings management. But debt management is the bigger market by numbers. Uh, and when you do raise interest rates, you are hurting those uh, more than you're hurting those at the top. Feeling the weight of higher interest rates, what do you say to them? His answer was cagey. It's almost as if, when you listen to his answer, it's almost as if he was really trying to convince himself of it. What hurts people more is inflation, especially those at lower incomes. Uh, they, uh, this will pay very large dividends in the future. And uh, the way he said it sounded uh, not really convincing. And it was, really, that's your best argument? I mean, you have no real data to bring into this saying, you know, this is the percentage of, of disposable income by which inflation has affected them. This is the percentage of disposable income by which interest rates have affected them. Clearly, inflation is the bigger threat. Something like that, but it's just this, this belief that, no, no, the inflation's hurting them. This will pay very large dividends in the future. Uh, but what, what uh, my, the argument I've made previously is what, uh, the Fed has done is it has substituted 
uh, the ability to make decisions uh, with the inability to make decisions uh, for the very people, especially those at lower income, especially for the very people he believes that he's helping. Follow-up question, are high interest rates really doing much right now to fight inflation for those consumers? Well, I mean, what's he going to say? No. Uh, yes, uh, along with uh, improvements in the supply side. Uh, housing, the lags between private data and government data, noting that private data is showing much more progress than government data is. Uh, will rents be helpful in the coming months? And his answer is market rents. Uh, are barely going up. Now, market rents are when you have an apartment, somebody moves over, and then you can re-rent that. You re-rent it at what, what's called market rents. But if they don't move out, uh, you have rollover rent. Rollover rents are typically much lower uh, than market rents, but rollover rents will slowly continue on for uh, years to get to market rents. They'll keep going up, and this is what he says. Market rents are barely going up, but increases take years to feed through to rollover rents. Uh, lags are longer than we thought will eventually happen, being that the lags uh, are in there and will eventually happen. Uh, if there's wide agreement that it will eventually happen, and they're seeing that uh, market rents today are barely going up, they may be willing to look past the lags on this one. Uh, what challenges? Does global divergent policy have for FOMC? Uh, Barron's noting uh, that uh, a lot of other countries are considering uh, a cut as their next move, and some have even started cutting. And he said other countries don't have the growth we have. We can be patient. Yahoo Finance, can disinflation still happen without economic pain? Answer, we thought there would have to be pain. It did not happen. We will get to 2%, hopefully, without significant dislocation. And the follow-up question, which I thought was good, now let's say we have unemployment greater than 4%, but inflation is still greater than 2%. What do you do then? Uh, and his answer is, I said, unexpected weakening of unemployment. It must be meaningful. A couple of tenths would not do that. What he's saying here is that as we keep the interest rate elevated, we would expect to see an increase in unemployment. We wouldn't do anything because that is expected. He was very clear that it is unexpected weakening in, a, uh, in unemployment. That typically comes about uh, from an external, uh, an external force or some uh, external event uh, that causes uh, the market to go, uh-oh, uh, we, better, we better protect our balance sheets. AI might be able to do that. Uh, I don't know that we've seen much uh, impact on AI on jobs uh, yet. Uh, there are anecdotal stories of, you know, AI caused these jobs to be a limiter of those, but certainly not at the wholesale level uh, that pundits were, you know, a year ago predicting uh, that AI would do. 25% of the jobs would disappear, 10%, 20%. Sort of haven't seen that kind of wholesale effect yet. Let's look at uh, some key jobs data from last week. We have the top table up here, ECI. The bottom table is Q1 productivity and unit labor costs. And the writing on the screen is the jobs report, both the household and the establishment survey. Household survey uh, says 25,000 jobs were added. Establishment survey says 175,000. Participation rate unchanged, 62.7. Unemployment rate ticks up to 3.9. For the 175,000, uh, private sector added 167, government added 8 in the private sector, goods producing industries added 14,000, services added 153, with education and health adding uh, being the biggest category, 95,000 of the 153. Temp workers now, uh, 16,400. Uh, average Weekly hours dropped by 0.1 to 34.3. Average hourly earnings quite low, uh, an increase of 0.202. Average weekly earnings, that is the combination of hours, which drop, and earnings, which didn't increase that much. Average weekly earnings down 0.01%, uh, 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 sorry, sorry, down about 0.1%, roughly 0.09. Uh, for who is, uh, what categories are getting jobs here, less than high school, lost 32. 
High School lost 109. Lesson BA up 99 and BA down 48. For age groups 16 to 19, lost 23. 20 to 24 gained 132. 25 to 54 gained 163. And retirees still happening here. Lost 319. This is interesting. Uh, is the mix between full time and part time? Full time uh, jobs increased 949. Full time equivalents that are made up by part time lost 914. So a big shift out of the part time category into the full time category under, uh, under the surface. You still had robust hiring. You still have a rapid pace of retirement, which is probably fueling this need for more health services uh, over here. Let's look at the uh, ECI. <clears throat> um, this is December 23, March 2024, quarter over quarter, three months seasonally adjusted. Uh, civilian workers' compensation from 0.9 up to 1.2. But look at wages and salaries. Flat. It is in the benefits. This could be a catch-up uh, from the union successes uh, in the fall. Uh, going to private industry, uh, wages and salaries, 1% uh, up to 1.1. But here, uh, for benefits, 0.7 up to up, up to 1. State and local government, uh, wages and salaries, 1.1 to 1.4. Big jump there. Very generous, aren't they? Uh, governments with your tax dollars. Benefits uh, from 1% up to 1.2%. This is uh, just a private industry. This is just government, and this is the total. You have to look at the total here uh, because if you're giving government employees more, well, they have more to spend. That is inflationary. Needless to say, the 1.2 uh, wasn't that great. However, when we look at wages and salaries, 1.1, 1.1, that is not bad. Uh, most of it came in benefits. Labor productivity and growth. Uh, labor productivity was not that good, 0.3. Uh, and um, that is a combination of the hours that are worked and the output. Output increased 1.3, but uh, you worked an extra 1.3%, like but hours worked were 1% higher, so labor productivity is 0.3. It is just equal to output minus hours worked. Uh, hourly compensation up 5%. Uh, so if we take labor productivity and hourly compensation, we get unit labor costs up 4.7%. So if you're paying people 5% more, but they're producing 0.3% more controlled for time, of course, your unit labor costs are up 4.7%, which is, which is pretty high. You want to see productivity uh, higher than that. So let's say productivity comes in at, uh, let's say, 4%. Uh, and hourly compensation is 5%. Your unit labor costs are increasing 1%. That is significantly disinflationary. <clears throat> but this uh, this number did not work out. That's uh, for the headline. It breaks it down into uh, uh, business, manufacturing, durable, and non-durable as well. With that backdrop, let's have a look at yields. And I think that yields are, I've said it before, I think they're becoming less and less interesting. Money market uh, rates all well behaved. Long end of the curve, we have a bull flattener. Powell was quite clear that the next move is not going to be a hike. Uh, but if they do move, the next move will be a cut. Either they'll stay here or they'll cut. So I think the uh, highs for the cycle are in. We had the Treasury refunding uh, this week, and it was yawn. Uh, you don't see any massive increases. You see pretty much as expected. Uh, and the U.S. is still a reserve currency, the reserve currency. So I don't, I don't know that you'll get stressed past the cycle highs that we have here. Balance sheet ran off by 40 billion. 35 of that came from the SOMA, down to 6.81 trillion. Uh, net runoff is 4.76 billion, being that starting June 1st, uh, the runoff will probably be 40 billion a year. Uh, down from 75 billion a year because only 15 of MBS runs off uh, in a whole year. It'll take a whole year from now to run off 480 uh, billion dollars off of 6.8 trillion. So we're not going to see a five handle uh, for a year and a half, up to two years. I don't know how interesting 
uh, this will be. It's interesting when it's moving quickly. When it's moving really slow, it's, it's just not a story. So I'm running out of stories on this page. I don't think that uh, rates are going to be a story, uh, being that Powell has seemed to have capped them at this point. Uh, Treasury issuance doesn't seem to be a story, uh, and the balance sheet doesn't seem to be a story. Let's go to curve inversion. We still have anything here. 655 days and 538 on the money market, the capital market inversion. Canada still inverted, uh, much deeper uh, than the U.S. is. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, this is the troubling thing for me, is how we can get this far without it under the surface damaging a lot of things. In Canada, it is reported that in the first quarter, insolvencies uh, are have it now exceeded uh, Q1 uh, of 2000, I think it was 2009. Uh, the right in the middle of the financial crisis, that Q1 has now exceeded that in terms of insolvencies. But Canada is far more interest rate sensitive. I don't have any good numbers for the U.S., but I am seeing in some of the companies that I do, do look at that have swaps in place that 2024, I remember looking at them last year, 2024, they, they run off. They have to renew their caps at uh, higher, not their caps, but their swaps at higher rates if they even decide to go with swaps. If rates aren't going any higher, why swap out? Uh, that means their interest expense for a lot of companies this year is going to reset higher. Money market funds climbed $23.62 billion, reclaimed the $6 trillion mark, both retail and institutional up, almost, almost the same. Uh, government up seven uh, billion here and four billion on prime for retail. Government up fourteen billion, down three billion on prime. Um, truth be told, I also don't know how interesting this is anymore. We have rates that are at the peak of the cycle. Money market rates are at the peak of the cycle. So I think what is happening here is a lot of operational issues. Is uh, uh, for companies when they have excess cash or build up excess cash, they always put it in, in cash or cash equivalents, uh, which are money market securities. And with individuals, is it surprising uh, that they'd opt for close to five and a half percent all the way up to the six month, pretty much in at five and a half percent, as opposed to take risk in a market that looks a little overstretched, overvalued, price per for, for perfection, maybe. This isn't interesting. Maybe the balance sheet is not interesting and the sum is not interesting and the yields are not interesting. So who knows? Next week I might just uh, start with uh, the inversion. And if there's anything, any story to tell, I'll tell it. But other than that, I would say what I said last week is the same thing this week. June, FOMC, 38 days away. Here are the odds, 91, almost 92% that nothing is going to happen, up from uh, about 89%. And a cut, 8.2%, down from 10%. We get the minutes uh, in 17 days. The jobs report for Canada is in five days. And if you play the grains, the Wazadi report is in five days. Wednesday, there's a 10-year auction. Thursday, there's a 30-year auction. And we have some Fed speak. Uh, Saturday, already happened. Cook twice. Uh, Monday, Barkin and Williams. Tuesday is Kashkari. Wednesday is Jefferson and Cook. And Friday, Bowman, Goolsby, and Barr. Going out to December, uh, having only one rate cut, no rate cut or one rate cut, you have about a 40% probability down from 60%. And uh, three or more. 4.7% uh, up from 1.5%. The weight of it seems to have moved to two rate cuts by the end of the year. Remember that question, which I thought was a good question uh, from uh, Washington Post. Given the calendar, do you have time to cut three times this year? Combined with another question of does an election year uh, raise the bar for any change in rates? He said no on that one. We're not political and no, we're not thinking about how many, uh, about the number of meetings and how many cuts we can get in. We're not thinking about it that way. Effective federal funds rate still stays at 533. The uh, reverse repo is still over $400 billion. The lowest was 327 on April 15th. Haven't gotten back there yet. Down $14 billion. TGA is down $38 billion to $890. Uh, reserves are $3.3 uh, up $45 billion. 
the combination of the uh, reserves and uh, uh, reverse repo minus what I think is where they're probably going to target 2.5 trillion. 1.267 has to run off. If we assume 75 in May and 40 billion for each month, you basically 30 months, two and a half years to get there. So that will slowly be grinding away in the background. Uh, they were running off more than 25 billion in treasuries a month, which means starting in June, the Fed is going to be an incremental buyer of treasuries. Because instead of letting 60 billion run off, they're letting 25, they'll be reinvesting 35. That is an incremental buyer uh, of treasuries. And when rates start coming down, uh, here's the double impact. When rates start coming down, uh, principal payments, prepayments on MBS m would start to increase. If they exceed the $35 billion cap on that, any excess is added to treasuries as well. So on a rapid uh, rate cutting cycle into next year, uh, with uh, the cap exceeding the cap on MBS of 35, especially if they start selling MBS because they do want to get rid of that stuff altogether, there could be tremendous support uh, on the long end of the curve, uh, depending on where the Fed uh, will be buying. There was one official who thought that the Fed should hold nothing but money market securities, uh, reduce the duration of its holding so that it matches uh, the money going out, the payment on reserves with the payment coming in from the Treasury. That's sort of a cash flow matching on that. I don't know. If you tried to do that with the Fed balance sheet, you'd probably squeeze so many players out of the money market that your reverse repo would just balloon. So I don't know if they'll get that done, but there is potentially a large incremental buyer uh, coming into the market as rates go down. We know that they're going to be buying at least $35 billion more than they are buying than they were buying in May. Because the cap was 60, they've dropped it to 25. They were always at the cap. They were always at the cap. So incrementally there that we have a new buyer for 35 billion. Let's uh, go to treasury.gov, uh, click on data. And a whole bunch of things come down. Go down to uh, national debt and click on monthly statement of the public debt. This is not where we want to be, uh, but if we, uh, you'd end up at the top of the page, just scroll down uh, to all of these. Average interest rate on U.S. Treasury securities, click on that. And uh, go to chart, and for the pivot view, we're going to select interest bearing debt. Uh, and we want all of it. There is the uh, average interest rate on the U.S. debt. You can see that it's been coming down for quite some time, but now it's been going back up. The average debt, uh, or sorry, the average rate was about 1.56. And look how much it's increased now, 3.19. You've got to go all the way back to, uh, there you are, uh, 2010, April 30th, 2010. Uh, to get to the same amount. Now you could say, well, we were much higher before that and there was no issue, right? But let's go back to April 30th uh, or the month of April 2010 and look at our debt. This is debt to the penny. Uh, the top line is total debt. So if we go back to April uh, of 2010, uh, where are we here? There we go, April of 2010, 12.76 trillion. It's 35 trillion now. Right, 12.76, 12, 12 um, almost triple, almost triple. So to have the same interest expense, the average interest cost would have to be a third, but it's not, it's the same. So in other words, the interest cost on the debt is now triple, <clears throat> just 14 years later is triple what it was in 2010. And when you go back to uh, 1995, you're 4.8 trillion. Right, and you go back to 1995 here. Does it go back to 95? No, what's the earliest? Earliest is uh, February of 2001, 6.5. So let's go to February of 2001. There we are, 5.7 trillion. We're six times higher than that. Uh, six times higher. So if we were one sixth the interest rate, the cost would be the same. We are not one sixth the interest rate, we're one half. Again, triple, triple the cost. Uh, I don't see 
I don't see any fiscal responsibility coming into the picture. Do you? You think Democrats will begin to balance the budget? Do you think Republicans will begin to balance the budget? Republicans will cut tax uh, and uh, not worry about the budget, uh, uh, the deficit. Uh, Democrats will tax more, but then think, oh, great, we can spend more and not worry about the deficit. There is no, there is no fiscal responsibility coming in. This is why uh, that line item, interest expense, will only increase the longer rates are here. It will only increase. So when we look at uh, what the Treasury has announced in the refunding, it also announces a bunch of other stuff, you know, like interesting securities that it wants to issue. Uh, the issue of callable securities uh, was raised again because if you issue callable debt, and interest rates go down, you get to call that debt back and refinance at a lower rate. So we're, we're, it, it sort of looks like the Treasury is starting to get concerned about the interest rate. And I think, I think Powell is concerned about the level of debt and the interest rate, which is why he seems rather adamant that the next move is not going to be a hike, which is why even in the face of inflation that we've had, he's been talking rather dovish. I think the writing is on the wall long term is that this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue that you simply cannot ignore. This will be a driver of economic growth, that if the U.S. government has to continue to extract more and more tax dollars just to pay interest, being that G is a component of GDP, um, you're either looking at bigger and bigger deficits to maintain the same level of spending at G or negative G. Uh, which means it would just be a drag on growth and that have to lower rates to support growth. Either way, I do believe, being that we don't see any kind of fiscal responsibility on the horizon, the thinking is rates must come down. Uh, they must come down. If you uh, had listened to Berkshire's uh, annual meeting, uh, Buffett was asked about, uh, about this in particular, and he said, just to just to begin to re, re uh, um, to to get back to a, a balanced situation, tax rates on Americans are going to have to go up in the next few years. Uh, I've been saying this for uh, you know almost a year now that if you are somebody with with wealth that you've earned, you you if you stay put, you don't get to keep that. You, that that will be systematically taken away from you. Every year there'll be a little bit more, and every year they'll say we just need you to pay a little bit more called your fair share, a little bit more, a little bit more. Uh, I don't see a way out. Either you tax the hell out of success uh, and chase capital away, or you bring that interest rate to the zero line. I don't know that there's a, a third way around this. We have been growing. This is usually how you get out of debt, is you grow revenues and you pay down debt. But as we've been growing, uh, so have the deficits. Again, Fiscal responsibility no longer exists when democracy is driven by populism on both sides. It's about who can give away the most money. Real rates uh, all retreating, break-even rates all retreating as well. Looking at the Fed Fund's futures, Q2, uh, showing three basis points, uh, meaning nothing really going on there. Q3, 20.5 basis points. Q4, 24 for a total of 47.5. Last week was 34.5. This is versus 75. We'll find out in June whether the SCP still stays with three or if they drop down to two. Still long, Fed Funds Futures. TLT, I've made no changes here. I did try for the 85 puts. I will say when I tried, I'm certainly not at the market. I was expecting more weakness, so I put in... Uh, an offer on 85 puts, never got there. Uh, but every day, faithfully, I put in my offers and never got there. So I didn't get them. TLT up 1.18% uh, over the last week. SPX up 0.55. Implied volatility just running for the exits. Uh, and there is uh, the reaction on the, uh, on the jobs report. I've made no changes. Um, Powell has again uh, been quite adamant that they that this is the height. They are at the height of the rate cycle, uh, rate hiking cycle. They're not going any further. The next move is not going to be up. Uh, either they'll stay here or the next move will be down. The Treasury starting in June is an incremental buyer of another 35 billion. 
The longer they stay here, the more they hurt future growth. I don't think they have a choice. That emboldens me to be very uh, aggressive with TLT. I don't mind selling every month at the money puts uh, on TLT. Mortgage rates still going the wrong way. 7.22 on a 30-year. Uh, the spread between the 10-year and the 30-year fixed rate now at 264 basis points. The widest spread was 309. House price index uh, up 1.2%. This is for February. Up 1.2% month over month, 7% year over year. Case Shiller up 0.9% month over month, up 7.3% year over year. The highest reading uh, on that index was 312.765. This was for October. We're at 312.179. Just a small little read below it. You get a 0.2. Actually, you get a 0.3 increase when we see March's number. Uh, then you set a new high on the pricing index. Crazy stuff. A new high on the pricing index. Uh, I, uh, mortgage apps down 2.3%. I also added to my ABR position after earnings. Uh, Pre-market, they were up around 1345 and then they sold right down. I had a 1275 in there. They went down 1272. I got my 1275 and then I think they ended at 1290 for the day. Uh, but they're they're navigating probably the toughest environment that you could put them in right now uh, and they're getting through it. So when things start getting better, I think they're going to do they're going to do quite well. A couple more quarters uh, that we got to get through, but I, I did add to my ABR position. I now have a total of 19,562. Odd numbers because I don't put an all or none, AON. And that's a modifier you could put on your, uh, on your purchase. Give it all to me or give it none. So if you have a bid out for 5,000, uh, the market maker is going to give you whatever they have. Say, okay, here's somebody who wants 5,000. Here's somebody selling 73 shares. You got them. Here's somebody selling 220 shares. You got them. So you get all these odd lots. That's how come I ended up with an odd lot. Uh, OAS, uh, not much activity here. All of them decreasing slightly except triple C. Uh, I don't know if that's just week to week noise or if it means something. Corporate bond issuance, year-to-date, 38% year-over-year. If you look at January to April of last year, 38% higher for the month of April. Almost $100 billion in investment grade, almost $30 billion in high yield versus last year, $73 billion in investment grade and 20, roughly $20 billion uh, in high yield. Uh, lots, lots of debt issuance. And obviously the market absorbing it because if the market wasn't absorbing it, you wouldn't have these kind, uh, these kind of spreads going on. Uh, not, not this row, but this row here. Or IG, you've got 90 basis points and high yield 316. You wouldn't have uh, tight, uh, uh, tight OASs. Or not, they're not the smallest, but they, they're small considering where we are in the cycle. You wouldn't have such uh, such tight credit OASs if the market just wasn't absorbing this. Okay, SPY. I uh, did short SPY on Monday uh, when I saw 510. I sold uh, I sold some calls. Uh, I did cover those calls before the Fed meeting, uh, and then um, Friday I reinstituted my short. After the uh, I saw the reaction, I put my short back in. I am short September ES at 5200. Uh, short on the uh, on the index itself. Uh, forward four quarter operating earnings. Both of them have increased. Uh, both the estimates have increased by about a buck, 253 uh, and 250. Taking the average of the two, uh, with the closing index, the forward multiple is 20.35 versus 20.31 last week. Surprise factor keeps coming down. We're now down to 8.4. So if we use the surprise factor for the forward uh, four-quarter earnings, not just the estimate, but increase by 8.4%, uh, and it does come in at 8.4% over multiple four multiples, 18.77. But we are we are giving it a 8.4% benefit of the doubt to get there. Implied volatility dropping 
here as well. The all-time high on SPY was set on March 28th. We are 1.73% below that at 513.86. Uh, above the 15-day, 511.64, which is 0.43% uh, um, above, you'd like to see a good solid 1% above to feel uh, uh, confident that perhaps the 50-day might begin to act as support. Not quite there yet, 511.64. Your bottom, uh, your downside, the 200-day moving average, 469.20. You get a disappointment from NVIDIA in a couple of weeks. You could see that. NVIDIA has pretty much kept this whole thing going. AI is pretty much being the driver of a lot of this rally. Uh, so it could, uh, it could derail. Uh, it could continue. Being uh, that we've seen some components of the... Uh, AI supply chain, not not the software side, but the hardware side, rather disappoint. Um, it is possible, uh, and Nvidia is priced for perfection as well on that multiple. Although, you know, if they come in with their growth, if they maintain that growth, uh, it's it's a reasonable price. But if their growth drops to twenty percent, um, well, then they are overvalued for the earnings. This week, again, massive disagreement on something that seems so logically objective. SP Global says there's 42, and you think, ah, these agree, but Sector Spider counts it wrong. It has Fox, Series A, Series B. It has a couple of companies where they have uh, two different stock issues out there, but it's the same company, it's the same earnings. It's not like there are two different sets of earnings for the company. So they listed twice. So uh, they're really down at, I think, 48 or 47. Again, kind of hard, it seems, for these three, these three places to get something so objective correct. I hope uh, if anyone's paying for a service from them, put a comment in, in, the, in, in the comment section below and answer this. Is it accurate? Is the stuff you're paying for accurate if they can't get this right i'm going to keep asking that question because it just see i i'd be going out of my mind if i were running one of these companies uh and and this was the the thing every week where you know we were just never right on something so objective i would be going out of my mind i would micromanage the crap out of that number let's have a look at uh at who's reporting um oh one more uh point i am short uh, ES, uh, because I am comfortable being short ES, because it allows me to extend some long positions. So if the market goes up, I'm okay with that. Uh, if the market goes down, I am okay, because the long positions I have would hold much, much longer than I would be short. So I think of myself as partially hedged on the long position, such that I'm running what, what you would call a long extension. Don't copy me. If, if, if you don't have the same conviction, don't copy me. If you think, well, the market's not going down, don't, don't just outsource your thinking to me and say, okay, well, he's short, I'll be short. I was wrong last time. Well, I was, I was wrong in that it went up, and then I was wrong to cover my short because I covered it at, at the worst possible time, so I was, I was wrong twice. Just because I'm doing something doesn't guarantee that I'm going to be right, but I am running an extension on this, so I have extended my beta to more than compensate for my short. So I'm still net long on the whole thing. It just, I can't ignore the curve inversion. Uh, the, mul the forward multiple to me at the height of a rate hiking cycle where the Fed is in saying they're in no uh, hurry to cut, I just think that... The multiple is about two times too high. And at an average of 250 points uh, in earnings, uh, yeah, the index is probably 500 points too high. Uh, which means if we're sitting at 51.27, at minus 500, 46.27, you're somewhere, you know, around the 200-day moving average, I do think that visiting the 200-day moving average is not, is not a a minuscule probability that it is a significant enough probability to pay attention to. Now, I would like that. 
if we went down there because I would get to buy my uh, more of my long positions at a lower price. I'm okay underperforming in the short run and even losing money in the short run to get into a better position for the long run. There are some people whose accounts are too small to be able to say, well, I don't mind losing money for the next three months. They can't, and they can't short in a, in a small enough size given the size of their account. Don't copy me. I'm telling you what I'm doing because it adds credibility because it's easy to come on here after the fact and say, I did all of this this week. Look how much money I made. Look how good I am. I tell you in advance what I'm doing, uh, which leaves me open to being proven right and to being proven wrong. And I have been wrong in the past, but in my defense, if you go through the last two years of everything that I've said on this channel, I'm about 90% right. Uh, yeah, I'm wrong. There are times I'm wrong, but I'm about 90% right. Oh, uh, I should add, one more interesting thing I did is I have a, a short a risk reversal. A short risk reversal means you sell a call and you buy a put. I have a short risk reversal on Tesla. Uh, I am, I've been accused of being biased on this one. I'm not biased. Uh, the valuation tells me how I'm going to look at it. So if this thing were trading at three times forward earnings, I would be biased on the positive side because I would say this thing is extremely undervalued given what I see. Uh, you can ignore some of the negative stuff because, you, because it has such value at that point. Yeah, of course it's three times forward earnings because there is negative stuff. We get the negative stuff. Uh, but the market seems to be missing all this good stuff. But when it trades at the valuation it trades at, trying to find positive stuff, what's the point? The price already has all of that in there uh, and more. Uh, I find that it's extremely overvalued. So when you get to something like this and you're looking at something that, that is this overvalued, uh, making the case for it, even if I point out the positive stuff, uh, doesn't support the valuation. I can still say, oh, FSD uh, has been making great progress, uh, but it's still a short because uh, they're extremely overvalued for it. So it's not a bias. It is based on where the valuation is, you would either be positive or negative. Let's say you were looking at buying a used car and you're looking at this car and you're saying, well, it needs new tires, it needs new wipers, it probably, you know, the seats inside look a little worn. Guy comes out and says, oh, you can have it if you tow it away. Uh, are you going to be negative on the car or positive on the car based on that valuation? It's free. It's like, oh, this is great. Suddenly, you know, you're going to look at it. You say, yeah, it has those things, but it has all of this stuff. Look what I'm getting for what I'm paying. But if you came out and said, I want 150000 for it, all you'd see is negative stuff because it doesn't match the valuation. That's not being biased. That's just trying to match the characteristics with the valuation that'd be a deficit. And that's what it is. It's a deficit. However, it is a difficult stock to short. Uh, and my comeback for people who uh, think that Tesla is the most fantastic thing in the world and have an only Tesla reality for the future, back up the truck and put everything you own in it then. Uh, you're a fan. Uh, load up. Well, then I should do the same thing. If I'm negative on it, I should put my money where my mouth is. I have a short risk reversal on Tesla. Uh, how I got that done is I uh, sold the 245 call, uh, 245 call, because of the shape of the uh, of of the implied volatility. Uh, calls are uh, much more expensive than puts, so the 245 call uh, paid for a 150 put. Tesla's at 180, so uh, 30 dollars to the downside and I got $65 to the upside on protection. So $65 of upside protection uh, buys me uh, a 150 put which is only $30 away because of the shape of their curve. So I thought that that's probably the most effective way uh, to short them is do a, uh, a risk reversal. And this is the January uh, 2025 uh, risk reversal. 
Uh, so let's see what happens. All right, let's see who's reporting this week. The very first one, they've already done that on Saturday. You know, Tyson Foods, they've done fairly well over the last year, up a little over 20%, fighting their way back up in a very tough market. Let's see how they do. Um, a couple of big REITs, Realty Income uh, and Simon Property Group. Tuesday, Duke Energy, big in Florida. Walt Disney Company, big in Florida. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, and I think we have another one down here, Occidental, on, uh, on Tuesday. This is after the close. If you're into casinos, uh, Wynn Resorts uh, after the close as well. Uh, next day, uh, not too much that's interesting. Most of the interesting ones uh, are done. Uh, Airbnb, I think that'll be interesting. I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like to see how how they do. There's been some conversation that they're not doing that well overall, but uh, their estimate, twenty four cents a year ago was eighteen. Uh, so looking at a significant increase, well, percentage wise, or not penny wise, but percentage wise. Uh, and Thursday, uh, it ends on Thursday. Uh, Warner Brothers. Uh, you have Constellation uh, Energy. Um, overall, nothing too exciting. I think the exciting companies are done. The big exciting company is yet to come, which is NVIDIA. And that's it for the week.